So good, good morning, everybody. I'm very pleased to see so many people here, particularly since the last tweet was at 12, at half past midnight last night, and I left a lot of people in the King's Arms at about 11 o'clock. So very good that you're all, all up and bright and early here. So this is really the sort of rolling our sleeves up day and getting down to work uh, properly. And it's what you might call a day of challenges. So we have uh, four challenges for you as the day goes on. Um, and we're starting with a, a, the cha a challenge, which I'll tell you about in a moment. But some housekeeping, first of all, if I may. Um, after lunch, there are, we're all going to meet in here and talk about the challenges of engagement. But then we're going to divide into four groups. There are four options. They're outlined in your program. There are sign-up sheets on the pillar just next to the sign-up desk. If you haven't signed up for one of the four masterclasses, would you please do that? You're not sort of binding yourself forever to that one class. It's simply because we have four different size rooms for the four different masterclasses. And once we know how many people want to go to each one, we'll tell you later on which room you're going to, going to go to. So please do sign up for one of those. Um, the, the cake we cut yesterday, we hope, is going to be made available at coffee time, so you can look forward to that. But before we have coffee, we'd very much like to get a photograph of everybody here. Now, Saeed being thinking about these things, we've actually, there's an amphitheater here. If behind the marquee, at the back of the building, there's some steps up to an outdoor amphitheater. So at the end of this session, I'm going to invite you all to go in a big sort of crocodile up to the amphitheater, where we'll just have a photograph, and then we'll come back down and have our coffee and cake. Um, uh, after that, please do ask if there's anything else that you know that we can uh, do to help you. We, we, my, my colleagues are at the desk, so any questions you have, please just let us know. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome back to Oxford Lisa Schwartz and Steve Woloshin. I, I've met them when they were here for an academic year. And in my mind, I regard them as dangerous sport enthusiasts. Now, they're laughing, and some of you that know them might be laughing as well. But the dangerous sport that they seem to indulge in is simply running around the university parks in Oxford, because sadly, my first meeting was with them when, was when Lisa took a tumble on, the, on that occasion. But anyway, it's great that you survived. No, no accidents so far? No, there will then. <laughs> That's great. Uh, but it's, it's, great to, it's great to have you here. They're professors of medicine and community and family medicine at what is commonly known as the Dr. Zeus School of Medicine. Now, it's really called the Geisel School of Medicine, but Dr. Geisel is the famous Dr. Zeus of the American children's stories. They're not allowed to call it that back home, but I'm told that we can call it that, uh, that here. So uh, that's, what, that's where they're from. And they're also co-directors of the Center for Medicine and the Media and the VA Outcomes Group. And I'd like to just quote something that, that, that's in your brochure. Their research addresses the excessive fear and hopes created by exager exaggerations, distortions, and selective reporting in medical journals, advertising, and health news. And there are many reasons why we might have invited them to talk to you today. But the particular one is because of their interest in overdiagnosis and the book they produced with Gilbert Welsh on that topic. And I'm sure. Diagnosis is something that we're interested in in Cochrane and in the collaboration, not simply because of diagnostic test accuracy reviews, but because how you define the patient population and the disease that, that, that they're suffering from is clearly of pivotal importance when it comes to doing the right reviews. So, Steve and Lisa, we're very grateful for you coming all the way from the States for, the, for our UK meeting, and we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me in the back? Yeah, OK, great. Um, so thank you, Martin. Um, so um, as you heard, Lisa and I are um, we're going to give this talk together. I'm going to do the first half. Lisa's going to do the second half. Um, we're um, married to each other. And, <laughs> and uh, well, actually, I, am, I have a microphone on. It's not working. It's not working. Okay. Can you can you turn it up? It, it is working. Oh. Okay. Well, can can you hear me now? All right. All right. 
Okay, so, well, you, you may have missed that my funny joke, so I'll say it again. <clears throat> Lisa and I are married to each other. It worked better, it worked better the first time when you couldn't, when you couldn't hear me. Um, <laughs> and um, we're general internists, so we see, we see patients, but mostly we do research. And our research, as you heard, we, we're in, we want to try to improve the communication about the benefits and harms um, of, of medicine to help doctors and patients make good decisions. And we mostly focus nowadays on, on information about prescription drugs, but our other main area of interest is over diagnosis, and that's what we'll be talking about today. And I just want to acknowledge that some of the ideas and images in the slides that we'll show you today are from the book that um, Martin mentioned um, called Overdiagnosed, which we wrote with uh, Gil Welch. So, um, we're, as you heard, we're from the States, and I don't want to sound like, you know, this hyper patriot, but um, when it comes to overdiagnosis, I think USA number one. Um, and uh, so, so it's a fun thing to talk about. Um, we're um, from up that little part of the States, up there, Vermont. It's almost Canada, and it's a very beautiful area uh, to live in. But, um, but um, and, and we're from the Dr. Seuss School, as, 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 you've, as you've heard. Um, now, yesterday you heard a bit about the United States. You might have noticed in the slides, um, like the United States was always the highest for healthcare spending and all that sort of stuff. Um, so we, we, we spent a lot of money on healthcare. We spent a lot of time focused on health, and particularly on sort of making people scared about um, a, a health. Um, and so, for example, here in Oxford, today is the 21st of March, but back home, um, March is Brain Injury Awareness Month, <laughs> Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month, Deep Vein Thrombosis Awareness Month. It's also Aplastic Anemia Week, Root Canal Awareness Week. I mean, that's sort of funny, because to, to have to tell someone to be aware of their root canal. That we have very skillful dentists. Um, America Diabetes Association Alert Day. And actually, Tuesday, this past Tuesday, was National DVT Screening Day. So um, there's a lot of focus on making people aware of, of health problems. You know, the idea that disease is lurking out there. Um, and, and the awareness efforts take a variety of forms. Um, oh, and there are 175 officially recognized disease observances in the United States calendar. 175. So they, they come in various forms that organizations promote awareness. This is a, a, a public service awareness from the Sloan Kettering Cancer Hospital, one of the biggest hospitals, it's in, it's in New York City, and it says the early warning signs of colon cancer, you feel great, you have a healthy appetite, you're only 50. Scary message, uh, <laughs> right? um, and I used to think this was the scariest one, but then I just actually saw this one last month in the New York Times. This is an ad that says if you have... <laughs> right. so. This, this is from a device manufacturer. They help, they make something that helps you diagnose uh, melanomas. Um, and then, you know, of course, they're, well, you don't have them, but we have billions of dollars of direct-to-consumer drug ads. And this is when it says, is she just shy or is it social anxiety disorder? Um, and, um, and then yesterday, um, um, Andrew Dillnott did those wonderful quizzes, so I thought we would do a quiz because everyone seemed to enjoy it so much. This is another drug ad. This is for a bipolar disorder, and um, I wonder if you could just, uh, you can answer, you can raise your hand. Um, this is, <laughs> has there ever been a period of time when you were not your usual self and you were so irritable that you shouted at people <laughs> or started fights or arguments? You can raise your hand or just write down, okay. Uh, good. By the way, um, I, we don't have to do the rest of the slide because you've all qualified for bipolar disorder. <laughs> but we'll do the rest of them for, for fun. Please don't get irritated. <laughs> uh, uh, you felt much more self-confident than usual. <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, how about um, you were much more active or did many more things than usual? <laughs> All right, you're, you're, you're going to have to get a, a double dose here. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, you were more interested in sex than usual. Uh, I, don't, I don't see any hands. Uh, well, um, so you're invited to take this quiz. And, um, and then if you, 
and I'm serious, if you answer yes to more than one of the, one or more, you're supposed to go to this site, isitreallydepression.com, where you'll find out about options, all the drugs that that company uh, sells. So the, the point is, it's, it's really hard not to have a diagnosis. Um, and, and, you know, like, if, I don't know, if, if some of you are awake while I'm sleeping, while, while I'm talking, then, then you may have insomnia, right? Um, if, you're, if you're not falling asleep and you're actually awake, you, you may have excessive daytime sleepiness syndrome. These are real diagnoses. These are, I'm not making any of this up. Um, if your attention is wandering a little bit right now, you probably have adult attention deficit disorder. On the other hand, if you're following what I'm saying, there may be a problem. You have obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, if you're not interested in thinking about sex right now, <laughs> for those of you who aren't, um, you may wonder whether you have hyposexual desire disorder, which in this guy, for a rabbit, is extremely unusual. <laughs> and on the other hand, if you are suddenly thinking about sex, uh, looking at this picture of Bugs Bunny, um, you. <laughs> You may have a section addition. And then um, I, I just, when I was doing this slide, I noticed that he's bald. So I've diagnosed him with androgenic alopecia. And the other thing I noticed, uh, oh, and, and, and the other thing is, in, in the United States, I'm not sure how it is here, but if you have any cholesterol, <laughs> any cholesterol in your body, then you have hypercholesterolemia or pre-hypercholesterolemia. Pre um, and it's true also for hypertension. If you have blood pressure, <laughs> Prehypertension is, is now a recognized, um, this is true. Um, and if you have bo bones, of course, you, pro you have osteopenia. Um, and then, um, and I know this is the one I just noticed, is he doesn't have any eyelashes. And there's actually a drug now for, uh, to make your eyelashes grow, um, Latrice, Lat Latrice. Um, so this, this guy has a hypotrichosis. But anyway, the point is it's very hard not to have a diagnosis um, nowadays. And, um, which, which is a problem because you know it, it's it's hard to be well. Um, you know, medicine's a double-edged sword, right? It does all sorts of wonderful things. You know, if you're sick, it can save it can save your life. It can make you feel better, but it can also do real harm. And um, you know, pain, radiation, bleeding from tests, follow-up tests, side effects of treatment, you know, labeling from uh, diagnoses, anxiety, worrying about things, loss of resilience. So there's a lot of potential harms from medicine as well. And for the sick, the benefits typically outweigh um, the, the harms, which is good, but this may not be so true for the well. And it, it, the reason is it's hard to make them better, right? But, but it's easy to make them worse. And that's why there could be too much medicine. And, and the kind of too much medicine that we're interested in talking about today is overdiagnosis. So overdiagnosis, and we're gonna give sort of a big, a, a big picture look, what's causing it, um, and there are really two main areas we're going to focus on, more testing and broader disease definitions, um, how the pros do it, and we'll take a look at how, uh, how some people um, promote um, more diagnosis, um, different things that are fueling the fire. And, and then at the end, we're going to try to answer the question that Martin put to us when he invited us to come here, which is what Cochrane can do to, to help. Lisa's going to answer that question. <laughs> um, so let's get started with more testing. So when people think about overdiagnosis, I think the thing they usually think about, um, because it's in the press so much, is uh, screening. So the overdiagnosis of cancer. I know here in, in, in England, there's a lot of uh, debate right now about mammography screening. And the idea with, with screening is we're actively looking for disease in healthy people. So we're testing people who have no symptoms to look for hidden early signs of uh, cancer. Um, and the goal, of course, is not simply to find more cancer, but to reduce reduce deaths and hopefully suffering from cancer. Um, and we, in, in the States, we do lots of screening. Um, in, the la in a recent national survey, among women 50 to 74, um, almost 60% said they had a mammogram in the last two years. Men over 40 had 46%, uh, almost half of American men have had a PSA in the last year. And um, some sort of ca uh, colon cancer screening for men and women 50 to 75, uh, just over half have had some testing. So there's a lot of testing going on. Um, and everyone's heard the, the, the message that cancer screening is a simple way to, to save your, your life. And that's one of the reasons why everyone's so enthusiastic about it. The problem is that screening, the, the reality is much more complicated than the slogans. 
The outcomes of a screening test can be that it's normal, and if you don't have disease, then that's true reassurance. That's terrific. Um, but if you do have disease and it misses it, then that's false reassurance, which is a harm. Um, or you may have disease that's missed, and that's a false alarm. Uh, or may, may have an abnormal test, rather, um, that in fact doesn't turn out to be a problem, and that's a false alarm, and that's a very anxiety-causing uh, uh, situation. Um, of course, the screening test may find a dangerous cancer. If finding it earlier um, leads to better outcomes, then you've been truly helped. That's the goal. But um, there's some people who have their cancer detected early who are destined to die anyway, and they're not helped. They're harmed by the earlier um, diagnosis. And then there's overdiagnosis. And overdiagnosis refers to finding cancers which never go on to cause symptoms or death, even if they weren't discovered even, you know, and, and, not, and not treated. Um, and the way it works is that there are some cancers that grow so slowly that the person dies of something else before the cancer ever hurts them. Um, the example that most people are familiar with is that many, many pro prostate cancers detected at screening are, are, are work like this. Um, and some cancers don't grow at all. People who are overdiagnosed can't benefit from treatment um, because their cancer was never destined to cause harm. They can only be harmed. And the, if you take a quick look at the biology of cancer, um, you get a sense of how, how this works. Um, this, in this graphic, we're representing the size of the cancer uh, along the vertical axis. Um, at the bottom is where the first abnormal cell occurs, and um, as it gets larger, we move up. Th th this is the point where <clears throat> the size of which the cancer causes symptoms. Um, this is where it causes death. <clears throat> and now we're going to look at time. And along this axis, the extreme end of the axis is where the person, um, w w death from, from, all, from other causes besides cancer. So some cancers grow really fast. And um, they, you know, they, they go fast from the first, appear first cell, rapidly reach the point where they cause symptoms, and then the person uh, dies. Some cancers grow more slowly, so there's a longer time between the initial cell, symptoms, and death. And then there are some cancers which grow very slowly, in fact, so slowly that they never reach that threshold where they're causing symptoms, and the person dies from something else. And then there are some cancers which don't grow at all. These are non-progressive, and, and again, the person dies from something else. These last two are overdiagnosis. Over so that you detect a cancer that was never destined to cause harm, even without treatment. Um, now, there's evidence for cancer overdiagnosis in lots of places, in, in breast cancer, melanoma, thyroid cancer, kidney cancer, lung cancer, which is sometimes very shocking for people to hear. Um, and it's probably the rule and not the exception. Um, the Cochrane um, collaboration really has been a leader in um, pointing out the problems of overdiagnosis and, and um, just quickly flipped through three reviews about three of the biggest cancers um, that, are, that we screen for. And in each one of them, um, overdiagnosis is mentioned in the, in the conclusion of the review. This is the one for mammography, this is one for prostate cancer, and this is one for um, colon cancer screening. Um, so th that's really wonderful, and, and, and the Cochrane collaboration should be um, very, very proud. Um, and by the way, I forgot, at the beginning I meant to say, <laughs> I completely forgot to say, I uh, apologize, is that um, it's a real pleasure for us to be here because we think so highly of the Cochrane Collab Collaboration and the work that you do. I mean, not just you know, as researchers, but uh, you know, as physicians, and just as, as people. You, know, you, you really have made the world better. And I also wanted to specifically thank um, Ian and Muir because Lisa and I got to spend this wonderful year here um, and got to uh, work with them and learn from them and get to know them and become friends with them. So I'm sorry, I meant to say that at the beginning, but I got all caught up thinking about that, um, that um, um, is it depression slide. So, uh, but anyway, um, so, the, so you guys have been all over the case with, um, with um, overdiagnosis and cancer screen, screening. Unfortunately, not everyone is listening. And it's a real uphill battle because screening is so intuitively obvious. It's so clear that it must be a good thing that many people find it hard to look at the data um, and, and understand that there really is a double-edged sword. Um, and one reason is the self-reinforcing popularity cycle. This is something that um, Muir has written about. Um, the idea that the more cancer testing that we do, the more screening that we do, the more cancer we find because there's a big reservoir of undiagnosed cancer. Um, and so the more 
testing it gets done, more cancer gets diagnosed, more people have a sense of risk because if they, if they hear, oh, all their friends, family members have been diagnosed, they, they start to worry that they're at risk. And that leads them to want to be tested. Um, in addition, because screening tends to find the earlier um, cancers with the best prognosis, including overdiagnosed cancers, which of course have um, the perfect prognosis because they're never destined to cause harm, um, th th these cancers that people are hearing about tend to have better prognosis, and so people have a better, uh, an increased sense of benefit from screening, and that leads to uh, more enthusiasm for testing. So this sort of popularity cycle is self-reinforcing and breeds enthusiasm for screening. Um, and there is a lot of enthusiasm for screening. We did a nationally representative survey um, in, in the states, and we found that 87% of Americans believe that routine scan cancer screening is almost always a good idea. 74% believe that finding cancer early saves lives most or all the time. And among people who had a false positive screening test, 40% um, felt that the false positive was very scary or the scariest experience of their life. And that's a pretty powerful statement. And yet, 98% said they were glad they had the initial test that led to the false positive, right? It's because when the smoke all clears, the, the, the false positive says, oh, I don't have cancer. So even false positives can lead people to be more enthusiastic about screening. Um, one of the other things, uh, it's more than popularity. Um, screening um, is often seen not as a choice, but as, as a social obligation. So one of the questions we asked, um, do, do, you feel, do you feel that a person of a given age in average health who didn't have different screening tests was irresponsible? When we asked about a mammography, when we asked about a 55-year-old woman in, in good health, if she chose not to be screened, um, sorry, uh, 60, over 60%, almost 70% of Americans thought that that woman was irresponsible. When we asked about an 80-year-old woman, 40% said that woman was irresponsible. 80-year-old woman who chose not to be screened for breast cancer is irresponsible. And we saw exactly, almost exactly the same answers for prostate cancer, uh, colonoscopy, and for pap screening. So there's a lot of the sense of it's a social obligation. It's what you do if you're a good person. Um, and this was the conclusion of the, the paper. The public is enthusiastic about cancer screening. This commitment is not dampened by false positive test results or the possibility that testing could lead to unnecessary treatment. This enthusiasm creates an environment ripe for the premature diffusion of technologies such as total body CT scanning, placing the public at risk for over-treatment, over-testing and over-treatment. Um, now, people, People know that everyone's enthusiastic and predisposed to want to be tested, and some people, um, I think, take advantage of that. This is uh, a, an advertisement, a website that a journalist friend of ours uh, showed us recently. It's about a clinic, a medical clinic in uh, Bethesda, Maryland, which is where the National Institutes of Health are. And um, according to this website, um, the D David Drew Clinic, our patients live healthier longer. So how, how come? What's, what's going on? Well, the reason is that they do a lot of, he, they claim, it's because they do so much screening. They do, um, they do these, like, they call them executive physicals, and um, they get, the, the patients come in, and this is the routine, um, this is the routine uh, testing algorithm. They get mammogram and pap if they're a woman. I, I assume that they're not doing it to men, but uh, PSA, colonoscopy, uh, low-dose chest CT, body organ imaging, which I think is a abdominal and pelvic CT, um, and then a variety of blood cancer uh, mar marker blood tests. Um, and, um, you know, so these are the usual suspects, although some of these tests are themselves suspect, you know, PSA and mammography. But nonetheless, the, 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 he claims that because they're doing all these tests, the pe people are living better longer. Um, and then, of course, they're doing these things, which no one recommends um, for the general population. Um, and then he points out that other, you know, the, the, his co competitors, you know, the regular doctors out there, they're just doing um, mammogram, pap, PSA, and colonoscopy, which I think you guys probably would think that's pretty excessive, but that's, I guess that's considered the standard of care back home. Um, so um, he, um, th this clinic actually presents some data which he claims shows um, that he's doing more good than harm with this approach. And here, the, the, the news is good. And you show, this is the results of 10 years of research that he's done on his own patient population. And it's got these patient testimonials. Um, my kidney cancer would not have been found until it was incurable if it were not for Dr. David Drew. Thanks to you, I'm now cancer free. And it's signed a now healthy patient. Um, and he claims that um, during, oh, sorry, 
during uh, the past decade at the David Drew Clinic, all but one of every 100 patients aged 45 to 65 survived, because of, presumably because of all this intensive sc screening that he does. Now, of course, you know, you're the Cochrane people, so you can see right through this. Um, but um, there's all sorts of problems here, right? Um, any disease screening um, will be associated with a lower risk of death because, um, in general, the, the people who are coming to the David Drew Clinic, right, they're, they're healthier, wealthier um, to, to begin with, and that will um, confound this association between the testing and, and the outcome. Um, and in fact, um, this was shown in this wonderful study, um, the, there's a big national study called the PLCO, prostate lung cancer, ovarian cancer um, screening trial, um, and what they showed was um, people who were, um, in the, who were screened were less likely to smoke, more like, pardon? Yeah, people who, who, who um, agreed to be in the, in the, in the study, so the people who agreed to participate in the screening trial um, were less likely to smoke, uh, more likely to exercise, had higher socioeconomic status, fewer medical conditions. Um, and 30 to 50 percent lower mortality rates for cancer, heart disease, injury, kidney disease than expected. So there's all sorts of selection bias going on that explains this way. But when people see these advertisements, they think, oh, it must be because of the, of the testing. Um, so lots of people uh, survived. We don't know how many were overdiagnosed, and he doesn't talk about that in, in the advertisement. Now, of course, the bad ideas aren't just limited to the United States. This is LifeScan, which is, I guess, the thing that you see around here, Life, it says in the red, LifeScan was founded to help address the balance of healthcare needs in the UK. Our aim is to ensure that anyone who wishes to reduce the impact of undetected illness can do so through a range of special, specially designed health checks. And it, as a, I guess as an American, it's nice to see some um, free market um, medicine here in the home of socialized medicine. Um, but you can pay your 250 pounds and get your cardio check and, and so on. Um, and of course, there are miracles, right? There, here's a testimonial from one of the patients who did this, and, and it says, um, within hours of my scan, they called me to say they found a mass in my kidney. I needed to see my GP as soon as possible. Within two weeks, I had my kidney removed, and even that time, the tumor had grown half an inch. Um, it was a shock. I had no symptoms. I felt well, and I subsequently recommended this to my family and friends. I owe my life to LifeScan. Now, fortunately, people, there are people here in the UK, Mar Margaret McCartney, among others, uh, on the case, and they set up this website called privatehealthscreening.com, um, and it goes through, um, it helps, you th it says what to think about when you're thinking about screening tests, and it goes through the pros and cons, and uh, helps people understand how to think about screening and see through misleading messages. So bottom line, screening's a trade-off. It can help some people avoid cancer death, but it harms many others. And overdiagnosis is probably the rule, not the exception. Changing practice is going to be hard because doctors and the public are primed um, on the earlier is better mantra, and we're, they'll need to be training to believe that screening is a genuine decision and not an obligation. So that's about screening, where we're deliberately looking for hidden disease. But more testing. Um, it doesn't have to be screening. We don't have to deliberately look. Sometimes we just stumble onto abnormalities that might be cancer. And the way that happens is because we do so much more testing, particularly advanced imaging testing. So for example, CT scans find many small abnormalities that have nothing to do with why the scan was ordered. This happens so much that there's actually a word, incidentaloma, to describe the ph phenomenon. Um, a, radi a couple of years ago, um, the, the, uh, there was a, a a lot of enthusiasm in the United States for total body CT screening. And a radiologist who was sort of promoting this idea was on Oprah Winfrey's show and talked about this and um, made a big splash. And there was a lot of media coverage about it. And this guy, this radiologist who used to be a professor at Harvard and, um, and the University of California, um, said, he said, told Oprah in an in in interview in the USA Today newspaper that he had done over 15,000 total body scans. So he scanned over 15,000 people. And the reality are, with this level of information, I have yet to see a normal patient. <laughs> okay. right. So we are doing more and more imaging. This is um, data from large um, health organizations in the United States, just to show what's happened over the, since between 1996 and 2010, there's been a 
a tripling of CT scan, rate of CT scans. This is um, rate per 1,000 uh, people, um, and uh, almost quadrupling of the MRI scanning. Um, so there's a lot of scanning going on, much more scanning going on. And whatever reason the scan is done, for whatever reason the scan is done, the radiologists are reading or, you know, not just the organ of, uh, uh, at issue, but all around it. And they're finding all sorts of things, all sorts of incidental omas. Um, it happens a lot. So um, uh, among 1,000 people who have a CT scan, so these are people who are um, having a CT scan who are healthy people, um, among smokers, about half of them will have some sort of lung abnormality that's suspicious for cancer, so, you know, a nodule, for example. Um, among non, which you know, there's smokers. You'd expect that, but among non-smokers, 150 per thousand will have a suspicious abnormality. In the kidney, um, 230 out of a thousand. So, like that person in life scan, those kidney abnormalities are very common. Um, in the liver, about 150 will have an abnormality suspicious for cancer. And the thyroid, not CT scan, but using ultrasound. Um, more than half, 670 per thousand people will have an abnormality suspicious for cancer. They're extremely common. The concern is that the incidental loma might be cancer. So the problem is, you know, now you have this information, now you're really scared, what do you do next? And so to find out, patients undergo tests. And these tests, of course, themselves can cause harm. Fortunately, most turn out not to be cancer. Um, so we'll go back to the slide. Out of the lung abnormalities detected in the smokers, only about 36 out of 1,000 um, turn out to be a cancer, a dangerous cancer. Um, for the non-smokers, and then for also for the kidney abnormalities and the liver abnormalities, less than one out of 1,000 turn out to be cancer. So a lot of, you know, these are tr there's a tremendous number of abnormalities found, and a tremendous number of these are, are, are false alarms. For the thyroid, it's also less than one per 1,000. Now, how do you think people react when they, get, when they have an incidental loma? When they have a scan <clears throat> for some other reason, the doctor says, well, you know, your lung is fine, but I saw something on your kidney, and it may be cancer, and you go through all this stuff. Um, how do you think people respond? Well, some people respond, um, you know, you'd think people would think it's bad, bad news, and they're angry, but in fact, sometimes it's quite the opposite. Um, last year, um, Pulitzer Prize winning columnist for the New York Times, Nicholas Kristof, wrote um, a column called A Scare, A Scar, and A Silver Lining. Um, he had an incidentally detected cancer, uh, a kidney lesion. Uh, I, he didn't say exactly what the scan was done for, but from context, I think it was, he had a CT scan of his back for back, chronic back pain. And he had this abnormality in his kidney, and um, the doctors told him that they thought it was quite likely to be cancer. So he had a four-day hospitalization, a partial nephrectomy. Um, he said he felt like he was hit by a truck and didn't feel really back to himself for a month. And then it turned out that it was a false alarm. Um, it was not cancer. So was he angry? Um, no, he wasn't angry. In fact, he was grateful. And his column, he talked about it. He said he had, a far more, he had far more appreciation for the glory of life because of this experience. And we tracked the responses on his blog because we were curious what people were writing in. And there were 300 responses in the first week. <clears throat> And I can't remember the exact number, but almost all of them, I think maybe only a couple of them, <clears throat> except for a couple of them, they were almost all um, echoed this sen sentiment that this is wonderful. Um, thank God we all have to do everything we can to look for problems. So anxiety, surgery, losing part of a kidney or another, another organ is a very small price to pay for the possibility of having your life saved by early cancer detection. This you know, the belief is so um, ingrained. We've all been trained to be afraid about health and to believe that it's always better to be tested to find problems as early as possible. You know, the idea better safe than sorry means more testing. So more testing results in incidental illness. Fortunately, most aren't dangerous, but the follow-up testing to rule out serious disease can be. Um, now, I talked about more testing, finding more disease, and it's not just any test. The more sensitive tests, of course, are the ones that find much more disease. And that's a really important issue because with improving technology, um, tests are becoming increasingly sensitive. Um, we looked at, um, uh, uh, we're interested in pulmonary emboli. Um, in the old days, when we were training, um, we, these were diagnosed with ventilation per perfusion scans. And I'm just showing you one there. Um, I don't know if anyone knows how to read those things. It just looks like a, like a Rorschach to me. Um, but in a way, it's, it's good because its sensitivity is limited because um, it can't find really small and potentially unimportant um, abnormalities. 
Um, on the other hand, nowadays, um, and since the late 1990s, um, the, the primary modality of testing for pulmonary emboli is a multi-detector CT pulmonary angiogram. And these things can find really small, um, they're called subsegmental uh, emboli. Um, and that can be a problem. Um, isolated subsegmental pulmonary emboli um, work like this. So if this is an artery, um, you know, it divides, and it divides again, divides again, divides again. So at the fourth division, that's the subsegmental artery. And they're really, really small. Um, <clears throat> subsegmental pulmonary emboli rarely result in a high probability VQ scan. So if someone had a, um, one of these things, it probably wouldn't be detected on a VQ scan. But they're seen in up to 15% of uh, positive CT pulmonary an angiograms, isolated um, subsegmental pulmonary emboli. Um, and um, they're often incidentally noted on CT angiograms not done looking for PE. So for example, in a consecutive uh, series of inpatients over age 80 who had scans done for other reasons, 17% had a isolated subsegmental pulmonary embolus. Um, now, it turns out they may not meet, need to be treated. Um, th this is a little controversial because there isn't a lot of data, but there have been a number of series um, so far um, with several hundred patients um, who were not anticoagulated. So they, weren't, they had one of these things detected, but they weren't treated. Um, and so far, out of these several hundred people, um, no recurrent PE or death uh, over three months for untreated patients. Of course, three months is a, a short follow-up time, but this is an area of, of active research to, to sort, of, sort out do these things need to be treated, or can we decide who needs to be treated, who doesn't? Um, some people argue that it's actually a normal function of the lung to filter out um, small lower extremity clots to prevent them from getting to the systemic circulation and causing strokes. So bottom line, more sensitive tests, more diagnoses, um, no change in death. That's what we've seen from epidemiologic evidence um, looking at um, pulmonary emboli. So for example, um, the, the, the x-axis is time. So from the 19, 1993 to 2006, incidence in um, pulmonary emboli has increased, um, but mortality has been really flat. And the introduction of the CT pulmonary angiogram was about 1998. So, you know, this, of course, this is indirect evidence, but it's, it would be sort of strange. It's hard to come up with another plausible explanation for why there's such a large increase in incidence and no change in mortality. The, the, the increased incidence is largely the small um, emboli detected by the higher resolution scans. Um, so more sensitive tests cause more overdiagnosis. They find less severe disease um, where treatment can ultimately be more harmful than the disease itself. So that's um, all I want to say about more testing. And I want to uh, shift gears and talk a little bit about um, how d disease definitions are, are broadening. Um, and so this, so now we're shifting to philosophy, because <laughs> what defines disease, right? Most conditions exist along a spectrum. At one end, there are people who are overtly sick. You know, you know that they're sick. You don't need any fancy testing. You don't need to be a physician. You know that they're sick. On the other hand, there are people who are perfectly well. And the problem is, where do you draw the line that separates the well from the sick? Um, and it's a, it's a very difficult question. If you Draw, if you have a narrow definition of disease, so if you only want to get people at the extreme end of the sickness scale, um, then you draw a narrow definition. The, the advantages are it lets you focus on the sickest people who presumably stand to benefit the most from treatment. The problem is you may miss people who stand to benefit, who have slightly less severe disease. So that may be a problem. On the other hand, a broad definition of sickness draws that line further along toward the, well, the, the extreme of well. Um, the advantage here is you probably include almost everyone who might conceivably benefit, but the disadvantage is overdiagnosis and overtreatment of people who are really healthy. Ideally, we draw the line based on benefits and harms to patients, based on really good, solid evidence. But unfortunately, there are many other forces working on that line. Um, and they're pushing, generally pushing that line further and further toward the well side. The broadest definitions of disease are often pushed by drug companies, device manufacturers, doctors, people who have some financial um, interest in expanding the pool of people who are diagnosed. Whether or not it helps patients, broadening disease definitions serves other interests. 
Um, and so how are disease definitions I expanding? Well, there's a variety of ways. One is sort of the medicalization of life, so where we turn ordinary experiences into the disease. Um, we turn risk factors into disease. So for example, low bone density um, is osteopenia, right? The, the disease is osteoporosis, it's fractures. But now the, now the disease is the risk factor, having thin bone. Or borderline high blood sugar is prediabetes. And then the other thing we do is we change the rules. We lower the cutoffs for disease. So for example, um, the cutoff for diabetes in, in the States recently was lowered from 140 milligrams per deciliter to 126, which instantly created millions of extra diabetics. Most diseases are on a spectrum from mild to severe. You know, there's sadness on one end, major depression on the other end. Occasional trouble sleeping can be severe insomnia. Borderline high cholesterol, very high high cholesterol, borderline diabetes, severe diabetes, borderline high blood pressure, severe high blood pressure. All treatments have harms. At the mild end of the spectrum, the harms often outweigh the benefits. At the severe end, benefit often outweighs the harm. So you have to be careful, um, think about you know, how that balance of benefit and harm um, changes as you move along the spectrum. The benefit of treatment gets bigger the higher your blood pressure is, for example. Um, this graph shows blood pressure um, ranging from very high hypertension diastolic blood pressure from um, very mild uh, diastolic pressure of 90 to 99 um, to um, um, mild, which is, it should be 100 to 104, moderate 105 to 114, and severe 115 and, uh, to 129. And, um, this axis shows the percent of important problems from high blood pressure over one year. Um, for people at the very mild end, very few people have uh, an important bad outcome over a year. But as their blood pressure goes up, the, the probability of having a bad outcome in increases. Um, okay. And um, this is what happens with treatment. Treatment drops the chance of a bad outcome in each, for each of those groups. But as you can see, the size of the change um, in absolute terms is much smaller at the milder end. And that's because you have much less risk to reduce to begin with. So the people at the mild end, they're at lower risk to begin with and have less to, to uh, gain from diagnosis and treatment than people at the e extreme end. Um, so what happens to people who are treated for mild abnormalities? Well. He, let's look at uh, cholesterol, for example, and look at a, 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 what we sometimes call a balance sheet. If 100 people are diagnosed with slightly high cholesterol and treated f over a lifetime, about eight will be helped by treatment. That means prevented from having a first heart attack. But 14 will not be helped by treatment. They'll have a heart attack anyhow. And 78 people are overdiagnosed. Treatment couldn't help them because they were never destined to have a heart attack to begin with. So when you start thinking about um, these different categories, you realize that there's a potential for a lot of um, overdiagnosis, particularly for people with mild forms of abnormalities. Okay, so now um, I'm gonna switch to how the pros do it. I feel like the energy is lagging a little bit, and um, we're gonna have this, hopefully this will be a little more fun. Um, so the, we're gonna go through three quick case studies. Um, the first one is a drug in search of a new use and how the media helped. Um, and um, this is a true story. <laughs> GlaxoSmithKline had a, a dopamine agonist, so a drug that was used to treat Parkinson's disease, a movement disorder um, called Requip, Ropinerol. And um, it was, um, its patent life was coming to an end. Um, it was not a very good drug. It didn't really work very well, and it wasn't very popular. It wasn't a first-line drug. It wasn't a second-line drug. It, w it was really a third-line drug. So it was not a really big moneymaker for the, the company. Um, but as it's, patent life was coming to an end, um, the, the GSK researchers were trying to figure out are there other uses for this drug, are there other ways to extend the patent life or maybe um, you know, wring some profit out of this, this drug. And they, they had gotten reports from people that um, some patients with a condition called restless leg syndrome seemed to improve taking this drug. Um, and so they decided to look into using ropinerol for restless leg syndrome. Now, when I went to medical school, restless leg syndrome, in my textbook of medicine, um, Harrison's textbook of medicine, 10th edition, defined restless leg syndrome as an obscure disorder without good treatment. Um, <clears throat> this story is how GlaxoSmithKline turned that obscure disorder into something 
recognized, uh, recognized medical condition shared by nearly one in 10 US adults. <laughs> this is a, a drug ad for, for Requip. Um, and by the way, so there, there were, the, the way the ad campaign worked, there were different ads in different uh, journals and different magazines, and the statistics changed. They usually, so sometimes they said one in 10, sometimes they said 10 million Americans, sometimes they said 27 million Americans, which some very cynical people said uh, it was because it was very hard to count these people because they were always running around because they were <laughs> so restless. But I think that's a, a very rude thing to say, so I won't even re repeat it. Um, so what is restless leg syn syndrome? Well, there are four criteria. These criteria were devised by the International Restless Leg Syndrome um, Society, which was a, a, an industry-funded um, group of researchers. Um, and, but in the 1990s, they came up with four criteria that you needed to have. One, an urge to move your legs due to an unpleasant feeling in your legs. Two, onset or worsening of symptoms when at rest or not moving around frequently. Uh, three, partial or complete relief by movement, so walking for as long as the movement continues. <laughs> no, legs, not arms. You, know, that's, uh, you have restless arms syndrome. That's, that's a totally different drug. And then fourth is symptoms which occur primarily at night and which can interfere with sleep or rest. And in fact, that's the primary thing that the company was interested in, in trying to help people with sleep problems. Um, you need all four criteria to get the diagnosis, and treatment is reserved to people with moderate to severe symptoms judged by frequency. So you're supposed to have 15 or more episodes per month to qualify for treatment. So, Glaxo um, started their campaign to promote Requip for restless legs before the, the, the drug was approved by the FDA for that purpose. So in 2003, um, they, they sought approval. So they submitted an application to the FDA because in, in, you, know, you, can't use, you can't prescribe a drug or advertise a drug for a condition unless it's approved by the FDA. If you do that, um, you get in a lot of trouble. Um, doctors can still prescribe it, but the, but the advertiser, the, the company, can get sued. Um, so they submitted an application. It takes a while for the application to be approved. It takes up to, you know, often up to a year. Um, and during that time, anticipating approval for the drug, they started their um, press campaign to sort of get people aware that there's good news down the line. Um, in 2004, they released, a, they did a press release from the American Academy of Neurology meeting. Um, there were actually two of them. The first one was entitled, Restless Legs Can Significantly Impair Quality of Life. And the second one was, Study Shows Will Equip Improve Symptoms of Restless Legs. Um, they also did a press release from their own uh, funded but unpublished survey. Um, new survey reveals common yet under-recognized disorder. Restless legs is keeping America awake at night. But guess what? FDA didn't approve the drug. OK? It's a sad story. Um, <laughs> and the reason they didn't approve the drug is that they said, well, you know, um, this is a drug that people may take for a whole lifetime. And the studies that you've given us to evaluate are six weeks in duration. And that's not nearly long enough. You need to go back and give us much more data before we'll approve this drug. Well, that's terrific for the FDA. So the company went back. And here's the long-term study that they did, a 36-week study. And well, you guys are the methodologic experts, so let's see what you think of this. 202 patients were entered the study. These were all patients who went to special, like, restless leg syndrome clinics. So these were, you know, high test patients. They all got requip for 24 weeks. The 92 who tolerated the drug and responded were then randomized to requip versus placebo. So it's a randomized withdrawal study. So they were, the drug was rapidly removed from the intervention group. Um, and then the, they, they were followed for another 12 weeks. The 49 who completed the 12-week trial were the, were the ones who were the, the FDA were, sorry, were the ones that the benefit of Requip was based on, okay? So does, is that a good design? <laughs> right. Well, FDA thought it was. And the drug was approved for restless leg syndrome. That, and that was the trial. Um, immediately, um, the company launched into high gear. Um, GlaxoSmithKline mounted a national campaign to quote, and this is from an uh, you know, industry document, push restless leg sy syndrome. No, sorry, sorry. This, is, this is from the Wall Street Journal. Sorry. 
push restless leg syndrome into the consciousness of doctors and consumers alike. So they launched this massive media blitz to get everyone thinking about restless leg syndrome. Um, initially, in the, in the first year, it was a $27 million ad campaign. Um, over time, um, it, it increased to um, um, up to four, almost $500 million over the next couple of years. Um, and it worked. I mean, the, at least there was a, an association. Sales increased from about $97 million to $146 million in the next year. And sales reached over $600 million by, by the next two years. So was the, one of the things we asked ourselves was, since one of the, the pattern that they were doing to try to increase people's sense of the, the awareness of this disease was through the media. And so we wanted to see, what, was the company successful in drawing media attention and getting media coverage? What we did was we conducted full text searches um, of major newspapers looking just for the term restless legs in the two years from the time of their initial FDA application to 2005, so after the approval, to see what happened during this time when the company was trying to rev up their, um, this campaign and get restless legs into everyone's consciousness. Um, and what we found was, we found 187 unique articles. Um, now, some of these didn't focus on restless leg syndrome. Um, so some of them were about Elvis's restless legs, for example. Right? You guys know Elvis, right? <laughs> um, let's look at that again. He's very restless. Um, but, um, and a lot of them were about other sort of, new, you know, about insomnia and other sort of new, new um, interesting disorders. But um, 33 of the articles were about restless leg syndrome specifically. Um, and we just looked to see a variety of um, w ways that um, the, the company and the media sort of, the media was co-opted into promoting the company's message. So the first one was, did they exaggerate um, the prevalence of the disease? And um, we looked at how many of the newspaper articles presented prevalence estimates. So two-thirds of them did. 64% presented a prevalence estimate. And typically, they looked like this. Um, the New York Times said at least 12 million Americans suffer from this syndrome. So they were quoting, this is a, that was a direct quote from a press release from the company. Um, the Chicago Sun Tribune, it affects one in 10 adults. Well, you saw that in the advertisement. Again, this is, this is, these were quotes that were directly pulled from the ads or from the um, press releases. So is that, that sounds like a huge number. Are there any reasons to question whether that prevalence estimate is accurate? Um, well, there are. Um, the 10% figure comes from a study uh, uh, of a single question. Not, remember I said you have to have four criteria? Well, each of the criteria have, you know, have their own sensitivity and specificity. The one that has the broadest net was the one that was used in this study. And 10% of people um, said that they had this symptom. And so they, were, they didn't have all four. They just had the one. But that's where the 10% figure comes from. Um, now, there was a better study that was done later. It actually was a drug company funded study, um, and it was a national study, where they asked all four questions. And here, the, the prevalence was about 7%. So 7% of Americans had the question. But not all 7% had severe enough disease that you would think about treatment. So to their credit, the, the company's survey actually asked those questions. And it turned out about 2.7%, almost 3%, had moderately to severely distressing symptoms. So using th this data, you could say, well, maybe the prevalence is as high as 3%. But there's reasons to wonder whether that's even um, true either. And the reason is, this was a survey. This was a, a random digit dialing telephone survey. And they claimed to have a 98% response rate. So a national telephone survey. Um, I don't know if any of you d ever do survey research, but um, if you get a 20% response rate, that's remarkable. So probably what this was a cooperation rate. In other words, people who didn't hang up the phone, who agreed, who probably, well, why would you stay on the phone if I, if I called you and said, I want to talk to you about restless leg syndrome. If you are interested, probably you know, you're more likely to say that you have a problem with it. So this is a very um, high test population. In any event, um, we, the bottom line is we think that there's, there's just no way to know uh, what the, um, the true prevalence is. It's probably a lot less than 2.7%. Nonetheless, um, we, none of the newspaper uh, stories question the prevalence estimate. None of the journalists ask, you know, where does that number come from? Can I believe it? Um, it w there was no skepticism at all. Um, then we looked to see whether the newspaper articles uh, created fear about the disease and its consequences. 73% of the articles discussed extreme physical and emotional aspects of the disease. So for example, um, the Daily Telegraph said, the condition sounds like a joke, but its consequences can be devastating. Driven to despair by years of sleepless nights, patients have become suicidal. 
Okay, so it's very severe. Um, then we also looked to see whether they had anecdotes of severe disease, and 42% um, did. They presented patient anecdotes. Um, then we looked to see whether did, did they present anecdotes of mild disease, because of course the more typical person has much milder disease. Can you guess what proportion of the newspaper stories presented an anecdote of someone with mild disease? <sighs> That's right. <laughs> The other uh, tactic that the drug company used, and this is very typical of these campaigns, is to alert patients and doctors to this hidden epidemic. 45% um, of the articles um, said that doctors failed to recognize the disease. So doctors are just too stupid to diagnose this thing. Um, for example, the Oregonian said, relatively few doctors know about restless legs. This is the most common disorder your doctor has never heard of. <laughs> Um, they also, 45% um, of the articles also mentioned that people are unaware that they're sick. So not only are doctors too stupid to diagnose it, people are too stupid to know that they're sick. And um, this is, a, for example, the observer said, restless leg syndrome is quite a serious sleep disorder that affects a lot of people. Their sleep is disturbed, and unless they're really awake, they will not be aware of it. Now, you can't argue with logic <laughs> like that. 27% of the articles mentioned a self-diagnosis checklist, like the ones I showed you for uh, bipolar disorder um, and, and low T. And, um, so 27% had a checklist where people could you know, just diagnose themselves. Um, and um, they also not only gave checklists, but they often also gave uh, a website where people could learn more about this condition. And for example, the Wall Street Journal said, Restless Leg Syndrome Foundation, a not-for-profit education and research organization, offers a potpourri of advice at www.rls.org. Um, so we, we saw this actually in quite a few articles where they would refer to this not-for-profit organization. Um, and we were curious to see, well, what does that really mean? None of the um, newspaper articles really delved into it at all. So we looked ourselves and you know, we're not investigative journalists, so we didn't know what to do. So we thought, well, um, we, call, we called a journalist friend of ours, and he said, well, we'll try to get the, the company's, um, the, the organization's annual report. And that's actually available online. And this is what we found, the Restless Legs Syndrome Foundation's annual report. Um, the, they list their, their donors, the highest level is the gold level. Um, a minimum of $250,000 per year. Um, and it turns out that, in fact, Glaxo, who makes Requip, actually gave over $3 million that year. Um, and I think they accounted for over 90% of their funding at the time. Silver, um, there weren't any, but bronze, 50,000. Pfizer, who at the time was working on a drug which has subsequently been approved for restless leg syndrome. So this is the not-for-profit um, organization. And then finally, did any of the newspaper stories mention that there could be too much diagnosis? Um, and none of them did. So I'm just going to show you a couple more things. These are just about the, there are only 15 articles that talked about um, the Requip, the drug by name. And I just want to talk about those for a minute. Um, so did they exaggerate the benefit of the drug? So how were the benefits of this drug described? Well, half of the time using anecdote alone. Um, 34% of the time, the, 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 they used miracle language. You know, the drug was a miracle. Now, of course, I know you're all thinking, you know, that's a very subjective judgment. What, you know, what do I mean by miracle language? So, for example, um, the Columbus Dispatch. It has been a miracle for me. So that we coded as miracle uh, language. Um, only one of the articles quantitated, uh, used data to actually quantify the, 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 the result, the, the, the benefit of the drug. Um, so what is the benefit of the drug? Well, um, the drug studies, uh, and again, these are all drug company funded studies, they used the, um, they, they presented mean improvement on the International Restless Leg Syndrome score uh, scale, which is a 40 point scale, higher uh, means worse. Um, so in the Requip group, uh, this is a 12 week uh, treatment trial, um, for the, the Requip group had about a 14-point increase, but the placebo group had a 10-point increase. So you can see there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a strong placebo effect. So there's a net difference of four points on a 40-point scale. Um, you know, you can decide for yourself, that, that may, doesn't seem like a miracle. 
Um, they also presented um, a threshold, you know, what proportion of people said that their symptoms were um, uh, very or much improved. In the equipped group, 73%, in the placebo group, 57%. So a net 16 percentage point increase in the proportion of people who said they were improved b because of the drug. You know, again, I mean, I'm not, we're laughing a lot, and some people really suffer from this, and it's great that some people, you know, benefited, but it, this is clearly not, uh, you know, mir miracle. Um, what about the harms? You know, all drugs have, have harms. How are the harms of Requip des described? Um, well, a third of the studies mentioned at least one harm. So 70% um, so didn't mention any harms. Um, but it does have a lot of harms, and they, they, they really deserve mention. Um, for example, nausea. Um, nausea was the most common side effect that people in these studies experienced with the drug, and it was pretty severe. 40% of the people in the Requip group versus 8% in the placebo group. 11% <clears throat> in the Requip group experienced bad dizziness compared to 5% in the placebo group. 12% had somnolence versus 6%. Um, and 8% versus 4% experience fatigue. Now that's very ironic because remember the, 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 the drug they were pushing into America's consciousness, this is the drug that was keeping America awake at night. So if they're giving you a drug that helps you sleep but makes you feel tired and you know, sleepy the next day, then maybe it's not doing so much good. Um, there are other important effects, side effects that have emerged since the drug came out. Um, in fact, FDA now requires um, a, a, that the label um, on the ad alerts people to the fact that Requip has been associated with sedating effects, including somnolence and the possibility of falling asleep while engaged in activities of daily living. Okay. Did any of you <laughs> take Requip, Requip for your is this, is this on? All right. that, that's very funny. Um, <laughs> Okay, so, um, well, that's enough of me. <laughs> so, um, Lisa's gonna now take you through, um, oh, that's right, okay, take you through the rest of the presentation. Okay, um, so now we're gonna look at the um, second case study, which is about the idea of helping patients overdiagnose themselves. And the, um, this idea was about the fact that Abbott was um, conducting a campaign about the five most important health tests every man should know about, and that includes one for low testosterone. I'm sure that's the standard of care here in the UK. <laughs> um, and the idea here is, right, all men age. But, in fact, aging is optional for men who have low T, and low T is low testosterone. And the reason for this is because um, androgel was the first drug that was approved for this indication of low testosterone in combination with hypogonadism. And sales have just you know, dramatically escalated. Um, and by the metric of um, sales, $1.4 billion in 2012 on um, testosterone replacement. And this is um, the company's website. Um, is it low T, um, in case anyone wants to check it out. And the whole motivation of this website is to get patients and their spouses engaged in this diagnostic process. So we've, let's take another quiz to decide, could you have low testosterone? This is a male-only quiz here, okay. <laughs> um, so are you one of the millions of men who may have low T? Um, and I won't tell you who filled this out, but, um, but this person, in fact, only had a lack of energy, a decrease in their enjoyment of life, um, and they were sad or grumpy. <laughs> um, and in fact, you know, if you have any of these problems, not even a sexual problem, you are a candidate for low T. And what the website tells you is you better go talk to your doctor about the signs and symptoms of low T. And not does it only tell you that you should go talk to your doctor, it tells you how to talk to your doctor so that you can present your symptoms in a way that will help him decide what treatment is best for you. I don't feel sick. I don't feel like myself anymore. What could be causing it? Are these symptoms I'm experiencing related to low T? <laughs> Considering my symptoms, should I be tested for low T? 
What medical treatment options are available? Think androgel. <laughs> what is the difference between testosterone? Um, so the idea was how do you get the patient to make it easier for the doctor to give them a diagnosis and give them treatment? But you can't just leave it to the patient, right? Because we know that men aren't always the best and that women are you know, the medical, um, you know, the medical care advisors in the house. So they created this great chart. What is he thinking? What is she hearing? And what is he really experiencing? OK, so this is the idea that the, OK, so he says, I don't have much energy anymore, she thinks. He's just making excuses. The issue, low T can affect energy levels and can affect the level of participation in the activities he once did. Wow, maybe I should su suggest that he sees his doctor about low T. Or he says, I feel depressed for no reason. He's in a slump. He better slump out of it. So when a man experiences low T, he can begin to experience mood changes. O often he is unaware that low T is a medical condition with symptoms that can affect him physically and emotionally. He may be reluctant to talk to his doctor, spouse, or friends, leaving him isolated and depressed. Help him talk to his doctor. Or, of course, the, the, what you would have thought was the first symptom to go in for, right, about testosterone was the sex issue. I don't have the sex drive I used to. Maybe he doesn't find me attractive, or he could have ED. Now, this is an important distinction. Low T and ED are two different medical conditions with different symptoms. I mean, the majority of patients with ED do not have low T. Low T affects interest in sex as well as the ability to perform sexually. Well, ED only affects the ability to perform. So if you really care, you'll have low T. Um, so, um, I mean, this is just a really amazing example of how the company is drafting the language with which patients should talk to their doctors or that wives should talk to their husbands. Um, well, is it really a disease or is it just normal aging? Um, and, um, you know, as with many of these disease definitions, um, you know, how did we get here? Well, in 2006, a panel of doctors convened by the Endocrine Society concluded it could be used, you know, testosterone to improve to sexual function, well-being, muscle mass, and bone density. However, six of the seven panel members who panel members who issued the guidelines worked either as consultants or speakers, receiving research support. Surprisingly, I know from the companies that make testosterone products. Um, so, I mean, we just have to be worried that our defini definition of disease is being created by somebody who has an, influ you know, an interest in creating the biggest possible market. Um, well, are there harms to not aging? Even the fountain of youth, I'm sad to say, may have side effects. And in fact, when the FDA approved this drug, they were worried about side effects. And when the FDA is, approves a drug that it's more worried about harms, they make the company issue this thing called a risk evaluation and mitigation strategy. And one of the requirements was that they do long-term follow-up studies. In particular, they were worried about prostate cancer and heart disease. And they were also worried about contamination because it's a gel. And so they were wondering about whether children would get levels or spouses would get levels and could cause symptoms. Um, so they were requesting 18-month studies, three-year studies, and seven-year studies um, from the date of approval. Um, and surprise, as of 2012, if there's no report of the 18-month or the three-year results in the FDA-approved information for prescribers. And this is also a fundamental problem where what happens is FDA approves these new miracle drugs. They're tested on relatively small numbers of people, but the long-term follow-up studies that are required to look for side effects aren't done, um, and nobody's following up on them. Um, the third case study is about expanding the worry zone for doctors. Um, and this is a hot off the press example. And the idea here is that asymptomatic doesn't mean out of danger. SAMHSA was a drug that was recently approved in the US for treating low sodium levels, hyponatremia, for sodium levels less than 125. 140 is what we generally consider to be normal. And the idea here is whether, even though the drug is approved for that, whether we can start to get doctors to think about hyponatremia as 138 or lower. So this is the medical journal advertisement 
for SAMHSA, which is you know, just usual business. But the thing that we were really disturbed about is we found this advertorial in JAMA about hyponatremia. And what it says up here is asymptomatic does not mean out of danger. And um, you know, you need to learn about the consequences. So we felt, you know, as doctors, we needed to be responsible. We better go to this website to find out. Um, this is what the website looks like, and you can find out, um, you know, you can see all the events that they're holding. You can get email alerts to find out the latest news on hyponatremia, and they're going to tell you the scientific data. Um, I just want to say that um, this site is intended for U.S. professionals, so don't tell anybody that I showed you this. <laughs> um, very um, secret information. Um, so, and just so you know, instead of being here today, you can in fact be in an event um, in Harrogate where um, the British Endocrine Society is teaching people about hyponatremia. Um, and the talk is being given by Joseph Verbalis, who amazingly has um, ties to Otsuka, who is the manufacturer of SAMHSA. Um, this is the data that's shown to support the assertion that you should start to worry about very modest um, low sodium levels. So one study showed that the risk of mortality started to rise you know, when it's less than 138. And what, so in this graph where they're highlighting the difference, so it's 0.027% um, the 30-day in hospital mortality, and it was 0.020% for 140. <laughs> um, a really big difference, you can see. But of course, I mean, this is, nobody would even consider even fluid restriction for 138, much less a drug. Um, but the idea is to try to get doctors to start worrying about these numbers when they're only mildly abnormal. And just to show you, this is a graph of the distribution of sodium levels in the United States. And um, you know, here's the mean value. And so 95% of the population is between um, 135 and 145. If you started to consider low sodium at 138, you could decrease the proportion of people who are considered normal to 58%. I mean, because you're starting to move right into the middle of the distribution. And this idea about the compression of normal, and um, this is just, to us, a really disturbing phenomenon when the company, I mean, and the, and, and the FDA was worried about this, that they would try to expand the indication. And they're doing it in this sort of backdoor approach through a disease awareness campaign, not through specific off-label promotion of the drug. Um, so these three examples are about creating more and more patients um, who are, we think, less likely to benefit from, from diagnosis and more likely to be harmed by diagnosis. So now we're going to talk about the fuels for the fire. There's lots of interest in turning people into patients. And of course, the most obvious that we've already talked about is industry, which wants to expand the market for their products. Drug companies are paying for the clinical trials, subsidizing physician education, physician detailing and advertising, funding advocacy groups, which, um, I, the, have you heard the term astroturf, astroturf, which is like the restless legs, sort of fake grassroots organizations. Um, they conduct disease awareness campaigns, and of course they run advertising campaigns in the US for consumers and for doctors. I'd like to just start out with the first ad um, for doctors that was in this sort of um, overdiagnosis category. Um, you may think it's a little dated, but I'll let you judge after I read it to you. The physician who puts a woman on Premarin when she is suffering in the menopause usually makes her pleasant to live with once again. <laughs> it is not an easy thing for a man to take the stings and barbs of business life, then come home to the turmoil of a woman going through the change of life. But estrogen replacement <laughs> makes all the difference in the world. Her sense of well-being returns. She is a happy woman again, something for which husbands are grateful. Okay, So this is where we started turning menopause into a disease. Um, so I guess everyone agrees it's not dated, right? <laughs> all right, but now in the US, our big target in terms of advertising is direct-to-consumer advertising. And this is just to show you um, how astronomical spending on direct-to-consumer advertising 
is, in 2011, it was 4.3 billion, down a little bit, but still incredibly substantial. And for a disturbing bit of context, um, the total budget of the FDA for evaluating new drugs is far less than the advertising budget for direct-to-consumer ads. So health systems also have an interest in turning people into patients. They health systems compete for patients. So they do a lot of academic center or medical center advertising. So for instance, the University of Washington, I'm sure, is very proud of this ad. We do Botox, um, one of the premier research institutions. Um, we actually did a review of um, advertising by academic medical centers, um, the top 20 US um, academic medical centers that are listed on the honor roll of US News and World Report um, research honor roll. And what we found was these are in ads that are touting a specific service or, you know, so 76% of them sort of imply that there's a benefit. They never quantify the benefit and very few of these ads say anything about the fact that there's harm, right? We know what we do never harms people and they never quantify it. Um, and then this is one of the great quotes that we've seen um, from Otis Brawley, who's now the head of the American Cancer Society, about the financial interest that medical centers have in, um, in promoting um, turning people into patients. So screening is a great loss leader. So a loss leader is an item sold below cost to stimulate other um, more profitable sales for the retailer. So he said, we at Emory, figured out that if we screen 1,000 men at the North Lake Mall this coming Saturday, we could bill Medicare and insurance companies for 4.9 million in health care costs, biopsies, tests, prostatectomies, et cetera. But the real money comes later from the medical care the wife will get in the next three years because Emory cares about her man, and from the money we get when he comes to Emory's emergency room when he gets chest pain because we screened him three years ago. Um, we don't screen anymore at Emory. Once I became head of cancer control, it bothered me. Though my PR and money people could tell me how much money we could make off screening, nobody could tell me if it would save one life. As a matter of fact, we could have estimated how many men it would render impotent. But of course, we didn't do that. <laughs> it's a huge ethical issue. But it's the idea that the health system also, they have screening days, and those screening days are a way of attracting people to become patients in their system. Um, and just to be fair, we'll beat up on our own institution. This is one of their um, egregious ads, vascular disease, don't kill and cripple, can kill and cripple, don't be a victim. And what they tell people to do is come in and get a bunch of tests that in fact are um, D recommendations from the US Preventive Sa Task Force, where the task force recommends against because they think that they cause more harm than benefit. Um, then, of course, there's malpractice concerns. Clinicians um, are sued for underdiagnosis, not for overdiagnosis. Um, and then there's true believers, and they want to increase public awareness because they think they're doing the right thing. And um, this is sort of, I guess, our most egregious old example of um, telling um, people to do the right thing. The American Cancer Society, who's been a strong proponent of screening, if you're, a woman, if you're a woman over 35, be sure to schedule a mammogram unless you're still not convinced of it's important, in which case you need more than your breast exam. You don't get a mammogram, you are crazy, okay? And now we can see the new version of this ad by the Susan Komen Foundation, the Pink Ribbon, um, which is our biggest um, organi um, organization, breast cancer organization in the US. And what they say, the key to surviving breast cancer is you. Early detection saves lives. The five-year survival rate for breast cancer when it's caught early is 98%, when it's not, 23%. So now you're not crazy, you're just stupid if you don't get screened, okay? Because who wouldn't want to um, change their chance of surviving from 98% to 23%, but these are totally misleading statistics, and um, we're not gonna talk about it today, but we, um, in our occasional column in BMJ, we explain um, how um, misleading this ad is and how the Komen Foundation should do better. And then, um, you know, this is the true believer phenomenon. This is an ad from the Light of Life Foundation, which was started by a thyroid cancer survivor. And this is, I think, just disgusting. I mean, here is Rachel, age 14, the day before she was diagnosed with thyroid cancer, okay? And what it says here, and I'm gonna blow up, 
Confidence kills. Thyroid cancer doesn't care how old you are. It can happen to anyone, including you or your children. A 14-year-old girl has about a one in a million chance of dying from thyroid cancer in the next 10 years. And it seems criminal to us to scare children. I mean, no professional organization has even considered recommending screening for thyroid cancer in general, but not for this age population because the disease burden is so small. So how can we go around disrupting the sense of health in our children? But true believers feel that, you know, that's what we need to do. Um, then, of course, there's the media, which hypes new epidemics, new miracle cures to attract readers. And then diseases also compete for funding. So this is um, the problem of competing disease interests. This is the structure of our National Institutes of Health. And what you can see is it's all organized around you know, specific diseases, except for the general medical sciences, which really doesn't have any funding, so probably shouldn't be there. <laughs> um, and the thing is, is that to get funds, institutions Institutes and researchers have an interest in making their disease seem big and important, typically by expanding the definition. And we've heard stories of people within these institutes not wanting to publish papers where the prevalence of their disease is too low, because they're afraid if people publish papers and the prevalence is too low, then their disease will lose funding. Um, so self-interests are served in each of these cases by expanding the pool of patients. And of course, this is a recipe for too much medicine and unnecessarily turning people into patients. So all of these stories sort of about overdiagnosis have um, a life cycle which ranges from terrible news to great news, right? It always starts off with terrible news, the hidden epidemic that doctors and patients are unaware of. Then we have a new miracle drug or test. That's the great news that's going to save everybody. And then what happens is unexpected or expected side effects emerge. Um, and then, you know, things sort of level out. And then finally, um, late in the cycle, um, questions are raised about overdiagnosis and overtreatment. Um, so this roller coaster, we think, encourages undue fear about the disease, enthusiasm about treatment, and fear about the treatment. And this is a one the one place where we think that early intervention in the form of skepticism can help. And we think this could be a job for the Cochrane Collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, in um, the last part of our talk, um, we're going to take the charge that Martin gave us to give you some suggestions about how Cochrane might help. We have um, a modest, we think doable idea, um, and the other is more ambitious challenging idea. <laughs> um, and these are just things that we want to float and promote discussion about, and they're just sort of ideas for brainstorming. Um, so, you know, we showed you um, this slide before about um, how, you know, the benefit of treatment varies across disease severity. Um, and then we showed you this about how, um, you know, what the, um, you know, how many people are helped, how many people it has no effect, and how many people are overdiagnosed. And you could imagine that you could do the same thing for primary prevention and for secondary prevention. And um, we know, um, you know, the great program about the summary of findings tables, and what we are proposing is the idea that you do a summary of summary of findings tables. And the idea is that you might create tables which present the benefits and harms of interventions, you know, from existing reviews, but aggregate them so you can show how the benefits and harms change across disease severity or across risk or across different populations so that you can make it easier for patients or policymakers to be able to see the benefit-harm trade-off. Um, we'll just show you an example when the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force made their recommendation about screening, you know, where they were sort of um, hit by a bus and called the death panel. They actually asked us for advice on how they could do better in terms of communication, and we suggested that they actually do simple layouts of the data that's behind their decisions. And this is the example of what we presented to them. So the idea is first that you could show the benefit of screening in absolute terms, 
um, for women of different ages as being a proxy of your risk of getting or dying from cancer because they're age-based recommendations. Um, so the first row is um, the 10-year chance of dying from breast cancer from women who are not screened versus screened. So for women 40 to 49, it's 3.5 versus 3 out of 1,000. So 0.5 out of 1,000 or 5 out of 10,000 women are in their 40s would avoid a breast cancer death from mammography from screening. And I know Peter Gertsch is not here, so I can say this. <laughs> He's always mad about this slide. Um, and, but you can see that when the benefit starts to get bigger is really for women in their 60s. Um, and then the second part of the table is showing the harms of screening. So screening results in a higher chance of having a false alarm. And there's not clearly an age difference here in terms of false alarms, but you know, we have two kinds of false alarms, false alarms that would lead to um, any testing and then specifically false, bre you know, false alarms that lead to breast biopsy because those are the more serious false alarms. And then we also um, present the higher chance of overdiagnosis for um, women who are screened and gave estimates, um, and I guess Peter might argue with these too, or he does, um, and um, estimates of overdiagnosis with age. And this is just one idea of the idea that if you are to summarize, because what's so great about your reviews is they're very clear about a specific population, but the benefits and the harms of treatments vary across populations, and so maybe by combining them together, you can help people to appreciate those differences. Um, so summaries of summaries present benefit and harm information across um, reviews for relevant spectrums such as risk factor, disease severity. And the value of this would be to highlight how the balance of benefits and harms change. So you can see where benefit clearly outweighs harms, where it's a really close call, or where harm clearly outweighs benefit. And the idea would be to help people, doctors, and policymakers understand who has the most to gain from intervention. So now I'd like to move um, to the more ambitious, um, challenging idea, which we mentioned to a number of people yesterday and didn't <laughs> find a lot of enthusiasm for. <laughs> so um, we see what you think. Um, but, um, and actually Jeremy Grinshaw was really helpful in thinking about what, oh, sorry. It was very helpful in <laughs> thinking about this. And I think that our idea is, is that whether Cochrane could develop something like a grade for disease definition. So we know it's a really hard business to figure out where to draw the line. But the question is, could we figure out some system for grading disease definitions either proactively or as a consult service for journalists or policymakers. For instance, in the restless legs example, when we teach journalists a lot and what they say to us is, well, who's going to ever look at the prevalence estimate and give us a quote to question it, so we just take it as fact. And so the idea is, is that we need people who are willing to look critically at these prevalence estimates to be able to start to question them at the very beginning. Um, and so, the grade disease definition would be, um, you know, some common, sensible, and transparent approach, just like the um, grade group has, but it might be a bunch of questions or sort of a structured approach to reviewing these kinds of um, issues. So, you know, what proportion of the population is defined as sick? If 50% of the population is defined as sick, right, that doesn't pass the laugh test. So there has to be some place where we say, if it's right in the middle of this distribution, right, it, it can't be right. How well does the definition identify people likely to experience patient important outcomes? Um, are there criteria for the validity of symptom disease definitions? You know, is it just something that the drug company made up and is so broad like that bipolar ad? Or is it something that researchers have really studied and winnowed to try to get to the best questions to get at the real issues um, for people? And the other thing is, does the definition include a quality of life um, dimension? For example, in a lot of the work that's been done at Dartmouth, um, a brown BPH, benign prostate hypertrophy, is that you know in the beginning everybody just measured you know how many times you got up in the night to pee, but 
What really mattered to men was, you know, it bothered some men more than others. Some men only got up once or twice and it really bothered them. Other men got up 20 times and it didn't really bother them. And the benefit of treatment really depends on how much it bothers you. And so I think it's important that these disease definitions don't just assess how often you have different problems, but also how much they really affect your life. But these are just kind of a starting draft of the kinds of things like sort of an Olympic master reader's guide or something. But the idea, questions to ask about disease definitions, and that you know you seem like you know a perfect group to do that, who has no interest and in, you know this incredible methodologic expertise. Um, so actually, so <laughs> Cochrane is uniquely positioned to suggest definitions, and because the disease group have you know, each disease group has the relevant content. You deal with these disease definitions because you have to decide who you're going to include in your review, and you have the methodologic expertise and, you know, the credibility um, and independence that I think is so unique in this world, that we think is so unique in this world. Um, but we understand that these are challenging dilemmas, and this is both an advertisement and an acknowledgement. <laughs> um, so we are holding a conference. Um, in September at Dartmouth um, on preventing overdiagnosis. Um, Paul Glazu um, in the B and Ray Moynihan and the BMJ and Consumer Reports in the US are sponsoring the conference. And we've had, um, amazingly, over 150 abstracts submitted to the meeting because there are a lot of scientific issues that need to be dealt with in terms of how to measure overdiagnosis and how to define, you know, disease definitions and how to communicate it. And so we're going to have a variety of both scientific sessions and also um, sort of policy related um, sessions to try to start to struggle with some of these issues. But we just think that Cochrane is a group that might really take an important role um, in disease definitions. So Cochrane can help by creating tables which present benefits and harms of interventions across disease severity, risk, or different populations, um, and consider or foray, just consider <laughs> or foray into the disease definition business, create a standard for grading the quality of disease definitions, and um, that disease groups might even suggest definitions or cutoffs. I mean, I know that's a more extreme suggestion, but it's certainly a possibility because we trust your judgment. Um, I know you have a lot of work to do. We heard yesterday um, how much work you have to do and how much pressure you're under to get these things out. Um, but we'd like to add this to your list of possible work. <laughs> so um, thank you, and we'd love to take questions. Thanks very much. That's really, truly outstanding. What a tour de force. Um, so questions. If you, if, it would be helpful if you have a question, if you perhaps just a little bit about you know, your background, where you are, or, or, or where you come from. I mean, one of the, one of the things that, that, that there, there are several things that you said that, that struck me as being relevant. I have to say, I, I've often thought that the integrity of the background section of Cochrane Reviews is something that, that could be improved. So when, we, when people quote incidence and prevalence figures, for example, it's not always clear where Cochrane authors get those from, but you've made a case actually for sort of challenging that as part of your mm -hmm. definition. Y yes, actually, that was one of the things we thought about in our, in our list, but we didn't know if it that way. But we agree with you because I think that's the problem is what happens is that prevalence estimate gets out and then nobody questions it. Yeah. And I think the idea of going back to the source to make sure it's believable if you're going to put that as your motivation for the review seems really important to understand. Mm -hmm. Because many times I think, you know, people have an inch, you know, it's the classic way to start anything. This is a big problem, pay attention. Yeah. Um, and so we're <coughs> all drawn to the biggest numbers. The, the, uh, there was a Cochrane review about restless legs syndrome, and they actually, they quoted the 10% figure, but they also got to the 2% figure. You. So, but, but there was no um, discussion of the, where the... You know, it, the they came from this sort of, you know, non, you know, unknown response rate dodgy. study. Dodgy, right, dodgy. Right, did I pronounce dodgy. that correctly? Dodgy. So, okay. <laughs> Questions, comments? Yes, here. Yeah. Uh, Mike, Michael, I'm uh, one of the co-eds of the 
uh, Cochrane Neuromuscular Disease Group, but I'm also a clinician. Um, I was interested uh, in some of the early data you presented um, on screening. Um, we're regularly castigated in the medical profession in the UK for our poor survival rates for cancer and how useless we are at treating cancer. How much of that comparative data between the UK and the US where everybody survives cancer whenever they have a diagnosed with it, <laughs> how much of that comes from overdiagnosis uh, and uh, incomparable prevalence rates and diagnostic rates? And how much is real and how useless are we in the UK? <laughs> well, actually, we have, when we teach about five year survival, we have a great example because Rudy Giuliani went after the NHS about five, five year survival. Yeah. I don't know if you want, do you want to see the slides? I mean, I, I mean, I don't know if we should do, we did so many slides, nobody can take more slides. All right, so, um, but, but basically, the answer that's very interesting is that five, while well, five year survival, um, is lower the population-based mortality, which is the better it's measure of body. It's substantially lower. So he, when he was running for president, um, he was, you know, it's like the Obamacare business. So they, they were saying, you know, we don't want to be like England and have socialized care. We want to have good American care. Look at our survival rates for prostate cancer, 98% five-year survival for prostate cancer. In Britain, what is it like? I can't remember. It's like 50%. Or something. It's terrible, right? Um, but the, but the, the, that's totally confounded, it's totally biased statistic because of overdiagnosis. Well, because, because we screen so much, because we actually, you can, you know, are screening, you know, is at a low level, but, and what happens is if you put all these people into the denominator of five-year survival who are never, de who are, are by definition going to survive, and so actually the population-based mortality rates for prostate cancer are very similar. It's I mean, it's an old, they're Virtually almost identical. identical. I mean, it's an oldish article that we found in the JNCI where they tried to, you know, cross-country comparisons are difficult, but they were nearly identical um, in terms of the population-based mortality. So I think sometimes you're being criticized because f the survival rate is such a misleading statistic and it's used in a, and there's such dramatic effects in survival and um, that they're unfairly used. I mean there are um, you know some sometimes it can identify problems but a lot it, in the setting where we have more screening they are, are so hopelessly biased that they should never be used for comparison or for saying that there's a problem. That's the, the criticism of the Coleman ad that we had there the 98 percent versus 20 percent survival that's all explained away by by both lead time and overdiagnosis bias and so um, so I don't know, we think you're doing a good job and you're probably doing less harm. I mean, that's the thing. For prostate cancer, and our, what we say is we think that you're getting the same result and you're um, The incidence making, is so much the lower. And the incidence is so much lower, so you're making um, you know, fewer men suffer from impotence and incontinence um, to get pretty much the same result. Okay, the next question is right at the, right, oh sorry, was there somebody over here? No, right at the back there, yes, thank you. There's a microphone on its way. I'm uh, Carl Mont from the Netherlands, an epidemiologist. Um, I was wondering um, about possibilities for additional research for, uh, for reviewers. Have you also thought about the idea, I mean, I like these ideas of summary of findings, uh, additions to reviews, and also great, but it, that's more qualitatively. Could you also think of something quantitatively? What crosses my mind now is, uh, I'm not even a health economist, but I do address this topic now. I mean, formal cost-effectiveness analysis, where actually these long-term uh, quality of life measures, utilities, side effects of uh, unnecessary treatments are taking account of. I mean, it's perhaps also already Jeffrey Rose in the 70s or 80s who addressed this phenomenon, and who's perhaps, perhaps the cause of all this, because he said we should not treat the, the most severe ones, but actually rather do a population <coughs> shift, as you might know, because for the individuals, it could be harming a little bit more, but on the population level, we are more cost effective. So adding cost effectiveness analysis standardly, it's not easy, but I mean, in a more quantitative way to our systematic reviews, would that be helpful, you think? I mean, I think cost is helpful. I mean, cost effectiveness analysis sometimes involves a bunch of assumptions and utilities that I guess are hard. I mean, I think um, it would be good to get cost into the uh, equation, but I guess sometimes, you know, there's a lot of assumption, you know, and the question is, 
would, it would be nice to lay out in the most transparent way the magnitude of the benefits and harms and then be able to look at costs. Um, but I guess the, you know, what we wonder about is just the, you know, the idea in quality adjusted life year. You know, there's just, the, they're hard metrics, I think, both for people to understand and some of the assumptions. But, um, but definitely cost is an important part, I think, well, there's no this. doubt about it because no you, with overdiagnosis, you just when you create these huge pools of patients who are treated, I mean, you bankrupt the, the you know countries. Um, so it's really important. Um, I don't know. At our overdiagnosis conference, we're going to have different working groups and thinking about the research agenda. You should come and make that suggestion. Okay. So the next question over at the back corner. Uh, it's Luke Vale from the Cochrane Economic Methods Group. And uh, it's not so much a question, but an observation. Um, you can incorporate costs within a grade framework, as being suggested. There's several papers. One's just been published. One is in the process of being revised. I know because it's in my bag to revise it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so it's uh, the, there are challenges putting economic evaluations into Cochrane reviews, but they can be done within balance sheets, as you've suggested. Um, <clears throat> and to make them transferable between locations, which is going to be key for Cochrane, it's often sensible to think about natural units and not necessarily always in terms of things like qualies. Uh, all of AR is balancing off the benefits and harms. Costs is just another metric in there. So. Actually, it's the okay. least important metric almost. I mean, it's just money. The more important issue, I think, are the burden to patients of unnecessary treatments right. and the utilities, which is the most important part of these type of analysis, I think. Okay, thank you. Another question right over the, um, Mona, right over the far side here. Um, thank you very much. It was a really brilliant presentation. And as I was listening to you and uh, having a Twitter discussion also about it, uh, it also strikes me how much um, it's not, it's not only commercial ones that make overdiagnostic, and sometimes historically you're, something is considered as a disease, but nobody goes back and questions whether we are, this definition is still valid or not. Um, and I'm wondering whether we actually what we need is an initiative similar to Jameson Alliance to talk about uncertainties in definition of diagnostic and raise the question rather than, because I think that was a big cultural change when we actually begin to think about some of the things that we had always there and just begin to question it. And maybe that might be a new initiative that might change everything, so. I think it's really interesting. It's also historically diseases come and go. Also, it's, it's interesting, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think that's a, a great idea. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm going to, to draw it to a close there because we're, we're bang on a course two. So a few announcements, please, now. Please, would everybody follow out into the courtyard, or down the side of the courtyard, out into the courtyard, and up the stairs to the amphitheater for the photograph. Then you have some chance to have some cake, and then we'll see you back here uh, after coffee. Thank you. Thank you.